Hi, I'm Edwin Rutsch and this is Dialogues on how to build a culture of empathy and today I'm here with uh, Dana Mitroff-Silvers. Uh, thanks Dana for joining me for this dialogue. Sure, thank you for inviting me. So I want to start off uh, just introducing you um, and you, I, you know, I looked up on your website, gathered some material here about you. So it says uh, that you're a web strategy and implementation consultant and a workshop facilitator and with experience launching digital products in museums, nonprofits, and educational organizations. And uh, you're working uh, on organizations uh, and helping integrate principles of human centered design uh, in, the, in their practice. And you also have a, a blog, uh, which is Design Thinking for Museums. And uh, you've written what the reason we're you know, chatting is you've written articles and done workshops and, and given talks on empathy. So that was uh, something we wanted to uh, chat about. But there's also your website. Uh, what is it? It's dmitroff.com? Right. That's the website for my consulting practice and the website where I blog about design thinking and empathy is designthinkingformuseums.net. Oh, okay. Is there more by way of introduction you'd like to say about sure. yourself? Sure. I spent the last 11 years at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art where I headed the website and I left there at the end of 2013 to start my own consulting practice with museums and nonprofits. And one of the things I left to do was to do more work around the notion of design thinking. And I'm assuming you know what design thinking is, but I'm happy to define it for your your website yes, viewers. Please do. It's a uh -huh. human-centered process of innovation, and it's a process that's being used by for-profit companies around products and services. And I was able to complete an executive education boot camp at Stanford at the Stanford D School when I was working at SFMOMA, and I brought this process back to the museum world. And that's the thing that I'm very excited about these days is taking this, this human-centered design process and applying it to what museums do, which is create experiences for visitors. And how can you take this process, which has been used around improving products and services and corporations, how can we apply it to what museums do in both the, the real world and in the digital world, in the services, experiences, and products that museums make for their visitors? Yeah, I'm really excited to talk to you about it because just like you, I'm very thrilled about mm -hmm. this whole project, uh, this whole uh, human-centered design in terms of mm -hmm. as a way of fostering empathy, using and fostering empathy. So I was especially excited to mm -hmm. uh, talk with you about that and seeing all the experience uh, that you have around that. You've also been part of a group uh, that's been talking about the Empathic Museum. There's a there's been some panel discussions and some panels proposed uh, around that for, at the uh, upcoming uh, American Alliance for of uh, Museums conference. So, could you just may you talk a little bit about that? Sure, sure. That's Gret Gretchen Jennings, who's a museum consultant, has proposed this session to the American Alliance of Museums annual conference in the spring, and we are hoping that it gets accepted. I think we're we're not sure when we'll find out, but she's asked a cross disciplinary panel of museum practitioners and museum experts to come in and talk about what does empathy mean in a museum setting. And I know you've already done an interview with Gretchen, which I've watched, and she talks about how her work around empathy and what, what that means to her. And, and, and I think a lot of what she's doing is around diversity and inclusiveness in museums. And this is a panel to bring together different museum practitioners to talk about different ways that empathy applies to museum practice. And if, if our session's accepted, it will be in Baltimore in, I believe, March or April. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. I uh, hope yeah. that uh, works yeah. out. And uh, the, uh, what, we, what I thought we could talk about is you, you have an article that's titled, Empathy is the Starting Point of Innovation. And I thought, well, maybe we could just mm -hmm. uh, talk our way through so, that. It was, it, uh, you know, I have it up here, and it, uh, it's designed, it's, um, it actually has a photograph of the empathic listening street team. It, mm -hmm. it opens up, and I guess you've been out to the maybe the Berkeley Farmers Market yeah. and and saw this uh, tent there for yeah. empathic listening. 
Yeah, I, yeah, because I live in Berkeley, not far from you, and saw this um, post set up at the farmers market, and I just said, "Oh my God, I got to find out what those people are up to. What what is that?" And then I thought, "Wow, what what if they had one of those inside a museum? How how cool would that be?" Because the whole idea is to build empathy for your visitors, for the people walking through the space. And at the farmers market, they had set up a booth to talk to anybody walking by about anything. And I stopped in to have a more meta conversation with them about who are you and what are you doing. And I thought it was it was a, a great picture, a great opportunity to talk about this larger meme. I think it is kind of a meme of empathy that seems to be popping up in a lot of places these days. And and my interest is around museums and how can museums have empathy for the visitor in the museum and and what I mean by that is how can you actually stop and talk to the people who are coming to the institution and understand what their needs are so instead of creating anything in a museum whether it's a print brochure whether it's a mobile guide on a mobile device whether it's a, a live program or a lecture before you even start creating it to have a conversation with the people who you're creating it for because a lot of the assumptions you'll go in with you may find out that they're just that they're just assumptions and by having a one-on-one -on -one conversation and building empathy for for your visitors you 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 may end up at a completely different place than you you thought you started out with and that's that's where my interest around this this theme lies and, mm. and intersects yeah there's a that within design thinking I saw a chart uh, comparing traditional thinking and design mm. thinking mm -hmm. and with traditional thinking it's design it and they will and they will come make it and they will come and design thinking is if they inspire it they will come or they'll buy it so what mm -hmm. you're really talking about is really listening to uh, the people who are going to be using the museum and really designing for what their needs are and really listening through empathy you know feeling deeply uh, into their experience and seeing what it is that their need needs are right right absolutely because before you talk to them talk to them being the visitor, the user, the member, the donor, the constituent, we have lots of assumptions and those of us working in museums, we are experts in our field, we have lots of education, lots of expertise, lots of knowledge, but we still may have assumptions that, that we, we go into any situation thinking the visitor wants a mobile guide, the visitor wants an app, the visitor wants a brochure before we actually talk to the visitor. Once we step back and have a conversation, you may end up in a completely different place than you started out because you, you're inspired through this, this conversation with the visitor. And an example would be one of the museums I was working at made the assumption that visitors entering the grounds of the museum immediately wanted a, a, a tablet-based app that would orient them to the space. And so they went and actually intercepted visitors walking onto the space and had conversations with them. What they found out is visitors say, whoa, I'm overwhelmed. I just got here. I'm looking around. I'm taking it all in. The last thing I want to do is look down and interact with something. Just give me a minute to take it all in and let me work my way in over into the threshold and into the space. And then maybe I'm, I'm interested in different kinds of information. And this was pretty radical to the staff to realize oh we just assumed everybody wanted this information so by stepping back and having conversations with their visitors they oh, lots of traffic outside here okay. they they were able to rethink what they wanted to provide visitors and 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 not create something that would would uh, immediately um, be handed to visitors right when they walked in the space. They, they were able to dial it back and think about other ways to provide information to visitors when they were further into the space. Mm -hmm. And they wouldn't have had these ideas if they hadn't had those conversations. Yeah, and maybe they could even have thought, well, we just have some chairs there for people to sit right. and get connect, you know, just to get connected somehow. There might be other ways for people that really, really address their needs for kind of orienting themselves and and getting relaxed and calm and connected to what the situation is. Yeah, that's, a, that's actually what you bring up as a great example because a lot of museums I work with go into any project with a solution already defined. So in this case, the solution was something digital where in fact by having these conversations with visitors and going through this, this methodology and then going up to the brainstorming phase, they often come up with solutions that are completely different like mm -hmm. the idea of something as simple as a chair 
like why not have chairs for visitors? Why not have a quiet space for visitors to reflect? And these things seem like, oh, these are very obvious, and they are, and they're often quite simple, but they're things that by stepping back and going through this process that starts with empathy, you arrive at these solutions that you, you otherwise may not have arrived at. And, and I think the chair is a, a great example because it's something that's very straightforward and simple, but yet often institutions are so caught up in we have to do this, we have to do this, we have to do this, that just those real simple things, real simple and elegant solutions often get lost. Hmm. Well, you had mentioned that empathy is a mean. That was the uh, first heading in your article. You're, you're saying that there's different uh, uh, conversations going on. You mentioned the Reagan Forrest writing, Gretchen mm -hmm. Jennings writing, and, and Susie uh, Karens. Uh, mm -hmm. So those are some dialogues that are already happening uh, in this area around uh, museums and empathy. Right, and then there's the larger mean, the the New Yorker, New Yorker uh, Paul Bloom, is that mm. his name, right? Mm -hmm. So all of these, seems like there's discussions on many levels within, there's in the museum technology space, then there's more the larger museum space. I think Gretchen Jennings represents that. She's not a museum technologist, but she's certainly an educator and interested in the visitor-centered museum. And then it seems like there are conversations happening in the, the design community, technology community, and then more popular, populist, I guess you would could call it. So it seems like there are lots of conversations around this theme. And for me, I I am seeing empathy as the the starting point of this process of design thinking, which which I mentioned earlier that I'm really excited about. Which was was the the thing that was the big light bulb for me a couple of years ago was taking this process and applying it to museums and starting with that most simple, basic um, step of having conversations face-to-face -face with, with real people, mm. which seems very simple and, and kind of a, a no-brainer, but it, it's actually not. And, mm. and that was kind of eye-opening for me to think about, wait a minute, when was the last time we actually got up from our desks and went into the galleries and talked to visitors to see about what they want? Not what we think they want, but what do they really want? And then let's test it with them. Uh, how, they, how did that insight come to you, that, that, that uh, awareness of the importance mm -hmm. of empathy? What, what happened? Is there a story around how that insight came to you? Well, it was doing this boot camp at the Stanford D School and, and participating in this, this boot camp with the, their executives from um, around, around the world who come in to do this boot camp. And the, the boot camp partners, the, the Stanford class partners with JetBlue Airlines. So we, go, we went to SFO Airport and interviewed visitors in the terminals hmm. and started to really build empathy for travelers and for staff and personnel. And I guess the light bulb went off for me like, oh, well, we could do this with museum visitors. Mm. We can, you know, we're, we're using this process and thinking about how do we redesign the, the, the ground experience for JetBlue travelers, but we could use this for any museum. It's it's a process that could be applied in in another setting, and I think that was a light bulb for me. So when I went back to my colleagues, I said, "Let's go. Let's get into the galleries and start talking to visitors and take pictures of them and share our stories and what what are we learning from our visitors and and start brainstorming around this and and getting getting to new new ideas and new places that we are not going to get by sitting alone in our cubicles." How did that unfold? How did that work? You know, talking with people, with your colleagues, as well mm -hmm. as actually doing it. What? How, mm -hmm. how did that whole process evolve for you? I, it's. It was very hard to get people to get up from their desk and 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 get out into the galleries. And once you get over that hurdle, I everybody agreed it was worth it because everybody had incredible conversations with visitors and insights and realizations that 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 they never would have had. There was, for example, there was a visitor we interviewed who was a retired woman who lived way out in the East Bay. I can't remember the other side of the, the tunnel. So she had to take, take BART into the city and she would plan her dentist appointment around the free day at the museum so that she could take this, what she viewed as a really unpleasant experience going all the way to the city to go to the dentist and give herself a reward, which was a, fr a trip to the museum on a free day. So her whole like schedule was planned around 
get get into the city, go to the dentist, go to the museum. And everybody thought, wow, this is this is fitting into her her life. The museum visit is part of her her overall life. And what are her needs? It's the convenience. She needs the free day. She she wants a way to reward herself. She wants to nourish her soul and her mind in addition to taking care of her teeth. It was like giving a whole new life to a visitor and and you know, nobody ever would have imagined a story like this that that we and then we all started referring to her by her name and well remember Renee said this and Renee said that and and developed into this persona that we would refer to often well do you think Renee would want to after the dentist appointment come to the museum and use an app or no Renee said she wants to pick up a piece of paper sit down and figure out what's on view she just went to the dentist She's here in the city. Make it easy for her. Mm. Let her relax. Let her enjoy herself. So, so it was just a, a whole level of engagement with visitors and understanding that we didn't, I don't think otherwise would have would have had. So you, I, what I was hearing there is to begin with, kind of bringing it into the museum. People are used to being in their cubicles or what have you, and there was a bit of resistance to get past that. But once they got past it, they mm -hmm. started really enjoying the dialogues and the connection, and then mm -hmm. kind of the doors maybe opened up. Uh, to the process. Yeah, and that's a resistance I see in a lot of institutions because now what I do in my work is I do workshops for museums around the country in design thinking. And there's always that initial resistance of like, well, do we really have to go talk to people in the galleries? Do we really need to? Can't we just jump to the prototyping phase of this process? Mm -hmm. do, do we really have to? Do we have to start with the empathy part? Can't we just jump ahead? And I say, no, we have to start with the empathy part before we can go and brainstorm and prototype and test. And there's always this little resistance like, well, we know our visitors because we did market research and we know what the demographics are. And we know, and, and I always explain to people, this is different than market research. This is not looking at broad aggregate numbers. We're not looking for averages. We're looking for those individual stories. So we're looking for that story about the the senior Renee who's taking the whole dentist trip and planning her trip to the museum around it. We're not looking for the average senior citizen's need. We're designing for an individual because by designing for Renee, we're going to come up with something a lot more innovative and interesting than we're going to come up with if you're designing for the average senior citizen who lives in the Bay Area. So, so I forget your original question. Oh, that was it. It was just about um, uh, well, there was actually the thing I was going to, it was just how everything had unfolded and then, and it was actually a reflection. What it was, I just reflected what I was hearing you say. Mm -hmm. You were adding to the reflection about the mm -hmm. resistance to uh, you know, maybe design thinking, the initial resistance and people getting involved in it. So, but I did want to jump back to uh, the meme. You talked about a mm -hmm. meme and I, I guess what you were saying there is that there's, uh, there's different areas, different communities are talking about empathy. So you're talking about in the museum, they're talking about empathy. I mean, in, in design thinking, they're talking about empathy. And then, uh, and and you mentioned uh, Paul Bloom's article. So mm -hmm. the Paul Bloom article, which uh, I've been doing a lot of interviews around that and been talking with him, trying to get him to do, uh, uh, to empathize with him, mm -hmm. and engage him in a dialogue. So he was basically critical of empathy. Mm -hmm. And um, I think what, he didn't really address, I think you're addressing, is that empathy is this first step towards innovation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's a real important aspect that he wasn't really seeing. That mm -hmm. uh, He was just saying, well, empathy, you're just, you know, you're empathizing only with people in your immediate area. You don't em empathize with people around the world and you don't empathize with future generations. But uh, I don't think that that's quite accurate. It's that really, if you can empathize with people, you can imagine you know other generations, and then that empathy is actually the source where this innovation comes out of. So I wonder how that kind of how that kind of resonates with you. Yeah, I think of empathy as 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 a a tool and a skill that that can be a starting point to leading to things like innovation and leading to new ways to solve problems and I don't really care for the bloggers who want to spend hours defining empathy like what is the definition of empathy like for me I don't care like you can you can spend hours defining it like personally I don't care let's do something with it like use empathy as a way to get off your butt get away from your desk and do something meaningful and so 
the there's a lot of bloggers and there's that bloom piece that gets really hung up in a lot of these nitty gritty details and I, I, like I don't really care like all I care about is this is a way to start to ground yourself to do some really interesting things that I think you can arrive at places that you might nor not normally arrive and and I know for for SF MoMA this empathy work informed the museum's branding campaign around the building closure because the building is closed now for a massive renovation and a part of the the branding campaign was about the building is closed but the museum is everywhere and one of the things we learned in this empathy work is that the the physical place of the museum is so important to visitors like they had a strong visceral reaction when we said did you know the museum's closing we're going to be closed for a few years for construction and there was like this visceral oh you can't do this to me how could you do this to me it was very personal and that kind of informed this campaign that hey we're closing but we're here for you and we are everywhere and here are all the places you can find us and during the closing weekend the museum did very very simple things like putting up chalk um, big chalkboards like what are you going to miss most about the museum write it here and come reflect with us together like little ways to recognize the feelings of visitors and and get I don't know that we would have gotten to these ideas if we hadn't had those grounding empathic conversations with visitors so I guess I don't really care about De defining empathy or what does it mean to have empathy what does it doesn't it's just like I see it as a way to just get off your butt and have a conversation and make something more interesting than you might not have otherwise mm -hmm. well, that's what I like about human-centered design is a process that has a bias towards action so right. the idea is you start empathizing uh, you start hearing what it is that people's needs are and then you quickly, you know, you do some brainstorming around that, but then you come up with a prototype, just test something to see how it works. And it actually becomes, for me, that the whole human-centered design is uh, like an empathic conversation or empathic okay. dialogue, that even your prototyping and your testing becomes part of that empathic connection uh, with the people you're designing for or with. Oh. Right, and, and right, and during this, this process when I do these workshops, we always tell participants that when you go do the, the prototyping and testing, use it as another opportunity to gain more empathy. So you may have come up with this solution that you want to test with visitors and, and some of the solutions I've seen in workshops were, um, there, there was one group I was working with at one museum that, that was, was working on a solution to have empathy towards parents coming to a museum with kids. I mean, there's an area where you can imagine a lot of need for empathy because parents are dealing with a lot, trying to visit a museum, keep their kids entertained. They created a kids, um, they called it a kids butler, somebody who would help watch after your kids when you came to the museum. And then they, they went to test that. And then they found, oh, they had a lot more learning to do through the testing, the game, the empathy, the fact that parents, first of all, they need help managing their kids when they go to a museum. But then when they were faced with a prototype, okay, here's the butler, I'm going to take your kids and go off to the museum, they went, whoa, who are you? I need to know that this is someone I can trust, that my kids are safe. So they, they found the, the, the prototyping and testing as another opportunity to build empathy for more of the needs of the parents. They need to know, not only do they need to have their kids um, entertained and busy at the museum, but they need to be safe, they need to be cared for. So we always tell participants in these workshops, you have further opportunities to gain empathy and go back and iterate on that when, mm -hmm. when you're going through this process because it's a circular process. It's, it's not linear. Yeah, and for me, it could almost be called uh, empathic design. I mean, that's what yeah. I like about it in the sense that the whole mm -hmm. process is really connecting, designing uh, the prototype. I'm, I'm being heard. I'm, I'm hearing. I mean, uh, what the person's reactions are and their experience. So I, got, I was just so thrilled when I discovered the human-centered design process. And like you, I did. I did, only did the the uh, several-hour workshop at the D school. So it was a lot of fun re doing, redesigning the gift-giving experience. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, I did want to put a plug in for definitions for empathy because I've done a lot of work around definitions. Okay. The one thing is that. Uh, the, the one thing in terms of seeing the different components of empathy, I see that as really helpful in that different parts of the process can break down. Uh, 
Sure. So by understanding that, I find that being able to create interventions uh, for empathy by understanding the different components, and maybe I'll just mention, talk, since we were talking about definitions of how I am defining it. Um, so I'm seeing four parts to empathy. The first part is self-empathy, so that's connecting with myself, my own visceral feelings. The second part is a mirrored empathy, which is through mirror neurons that we um, see an action or do an action, the same neurons fire uh, in our brains. There's the, uh, another, the third component is imaginative empathy, that we can imagine somebody else's situation, what it's like to be them. And then the fourth part is empathic action, that as we have that connection with others and we really connect deeply, that we, it's almost like a biological imperative or the, just a desire. People want to contribute to each other's well-being. Um, so, uh, so that's anyway. That, so, one thing about the definitions is you can see different aspects of empathy, and those different steps can kind of break down, and kind of breaking it down, I think, can be uh, uh, helpful. So, I don't want to put a plug in yeah. for definitions. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's very, very helpful to hear. I'm thinking more of the the dictionary definitions that uh -huh. I often hear people refer to. Well, what does Merriam-Webster say? Yeah, they get very, very uh, simplistic in mm -hmm. that sense. Yes. But the, the whole empathy and innovation, I think, is such a, uh, just a, such a great uh, component. And um, I, when I talked to Paul Bloom, I'm trying to line up interview with him, so I want to bring that up because it was in the New Yorker and it did have a lot of play. You know, a lot of people mm -hmm. saw that and it created a lot of discussion. Um, so, uh, okay, that was the empathy is a meme, then empathy is a toolkit. Uh, I'm just I was going to go through the headings here and make sure. sure we covered everything. So that was really about the um, Paul Bloom article. I don't know if you remember that. Is there more about empathy as, as part of a toolkit? Yeah, that it's just one of the tools in the human-centered designer's toolkit is before you go design th something for humans, you have empathy for those humans, and it's the place you start, the thing that grounds you. And before you even get to defining the problem you want to solve and, and ideating on it and prototyping and testing it, you start with the empathy. And, and so I just see it as, as the first step and something that you take out of your toolbox and always come back to it before you jump to solutions which I find is so common in every organization. Mm -hmm. Every organization I work with in my consulting work calls me up and says, we want to make an XYZ and whatever, insert whatever technology you want. And I said, well, whoa, 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 step back. Why does it have to be an app? Why does it have to be a tablet app? Why does it have to be a website? Well, because we know that that's what our visitors want. So I said, well, let's stop and let's, let's talk to them. Let's find out what their needs are. And often we find out, no, that's actually not what they need. So it's just that place to start, that, that essential first step. Yeah, so the, the whole point about uh, there's this impetus that people want to just go right into designing, just right, right. into problem solving. Right. I've been interviewing, doing other interviews with human-centered designers, and that's one of the, the big points that keeps coming up again is people want to just blow past the empathy part and mm -hmm. get right into design because we're action-oriented folks here. And then they start designing for the wrong problem. Right. And it's really, so that first part, the empathic design is like, is really critical and, and not to be just, you know, bypassed. Right. Yeah. And it's so hard. And, and I myself have been guilty of it. And, and, I, and I know there are situations where, that's how it has to be. If there's a situation where, I, especially when I work with nonprofits and museums, where they have a grant from a funder and the funder wants X, you know, you have those parameters. You have to work within those constraints. But even within those constraints, there still are ways you can work in empathy. So if you know that the funder says it has to be a mobile app, I mean, that's what it has to be. Okay, well, at least it has to be a mobile app. Let's figure out what the needs are of the users of this app and let's have some empathy for their needs and try to design the app to meet those needs. But in the ideal world, I think you would step back before you say, we're going to make X, Y, and Z, and you would question all those assumptions and work through this process. Hmm. But I well, recognize that that's not possible in many nonprofit institutions. Well, with human-centered design, it breaks down to the, to the various steps of starting off with empathy, at least the Stanford uh, model, right. empathy, 
um, define the problem, uh, ideate for kind of brainstorming, prototyping, and testing. And in that uh, empathy part, once what I'm seeing something, the part that I'm seeing in there is that I don't hear much about is how do you create an empathic team? In the sense, I'm just imagining if you're bringing together people from all these different disciplines, that there must be a lot of uh, conflict coming up. Like, oh, I don't feel heard, or you know, I think we should do it this way. No, we should do it this way. That there's like a need for actually doing some empathy building among the teams. I was wondering if you'd you know, kind of run into that mm -hmm. and what how you, how you've been dealing with that. Yeah, that's something that the the Stanford D School provides guidelines around brainstorming. So there are guidelines and that's really for just that specific phase where it's kind of ground rules for how the team interacts together. That that you know every idea is a valid idea, don't don't cut off each other, say yes and to each other, don't don't jump to constraints. And so there are some ground rules around the process that when, when I'm teaching it, I try to come back to over and over. We also do training before we go do empathy interviews, talk about what does it mean to have an open-ended conversation with somebody. What does it mean to follow, like let them guide the conversation. It's not about you, the museum person, leading the conversation. It's about them. And I, and I often find that it takes one or two interviews to warm up to get used to this, to really just take off your expert hat and, and just let the visitor guide the conversation. And it's, it's, it's challenging. I think these are muscles that have to be exercised. And I think in the ideal world, one of the ways that I would deal with the, the team dynamic and the way to get an optimal team, personally, I would make everybody take an improv class. That uh -huh. I take improv classes at Berkeley Rep Theater, and I think that's the best skill, the best training anybody can have in how to work together as a team and how to throw your ego away, let, don't try to drive things, be open to your partners. I mean, that's, I think, the best training anybody can have. But that's, I know, not realistic in, in mm -hmm. most organizations, so I try to bring in little exercises we can do together, just practicing yes and to each other. Mm -hmm. How can we build off the ideas of, of each other? But it's yeah, always so it's, a challenge. It's that that, um, that uh, improv, I do contact improv. So it's ah. a very, I don't know if you could, so it's a very, that improv, you just have to really listen to the person that mm -hmm. you're connecting with and, and acting in, in the moment. And right. In terms of your list, your, your dialoguing, like here I am, I'm interviewing people, I'm always wondering about my own interviewing mm -hmm. skills and so forth. What have you uh, learned about interviewing for with empathy? Do you have any kind of insights that you've come across? Uh, that, that sometimes it can get uncomfortable because you're trying to really get at their needs and emotions and that for some people it's really uncomfortable. And, and I think that in those situations, it's good for, for colleagues to pair up if one person is just very introverted and just not comfortable when you're having a conversation with someone to say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, how did you feel then? Or what were you really thinking? And if somebody's just not comfortable, they just want to get very superficial, it's sometimes better to partner up with someone who's a little more comfortable mm -hmm. pushing. because. Mm -hmm. I think everybody has different styles, and I want to have empathy for those people who may not be comfortable doing that. But I think to get to some really juicy, good stuff that can lead you to some pretty incredible solutions, you have to push a little bit, which can get uncomfortable for some mm. people. Uh, what, is, what would you say is your style there in terms of inter empathic interviewing? What is it? You know, how, how do you do it personally? Well, I'm definitely the one who's the more extroverted comfortable doing it, which is probably why I like leading workshops and I like doing improv, but I always recognize that there are, are folks who say, no way, I just want to take notes when I go, and when I, I, want, I want to be there because I can, a lot of, lot of my coworkers found incredible value and benefit from doing empathy interviews with visitors, but they didn't want to be the one talking. They wanted to be the one taking notes and documenting with, with pictures, and I say that's, that's perfectly valid. You, you can partner up with a, a colleague who is more comfortable. I'm going to just go out there and I'm not shy talking to people. Mm -hmm. But even then I find those folks who are more reserved still get a lot out of this because they're there with the real person having, you know, 
experiencing this and they often start to warm up and pretty soon they're like okay I'm ready to start doing the interviews now mm -hmm. so you're more introverted you don't I and mean, you're more extroverted and kind of dialoguing with people and yeah. asking them questions just feels comfortable to you and, yeah and uh, okay well um, let's see then there's uh, going through your your article uh, you had mentioned this uh, as well designing for individual needs versus market research so you'd, uh, you'd addressed that before that there's a uh, that sometimes it's just data, you know, what's the research and not really going and talking. Mm -hmm. So you kind of address that, but if you have anything to add to that? Um, not, not really that, I guess the only thing is that this process is not about market research and it's not about making, m making things, solutions, services, experiences that are going to satisfy everybody. It's about about thinking about individuals and by designing for individuals it's going to get you to a place that you you might not get to if you're trying to meet everybody's needs and and I think that there's and I'm trying to remember the example we use in our workshops about you think of things that are designed for everybody they can seem pretty boring and bland and mediocre or think about things that kind of push the envelope that are designed for what what in at the D school they call them extreme users they, they talk about and the example that that is often given and you've probably heard this example in other interviews is the the OXO good grips the kitchen tools and how those were designed for an elderly woman with arthritis but it lended it ended up creating such, a, a, such an innovative product that now everybody wants to use them but they were designed for an elderly person with arthritis and and if 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 it had just been designed for the average kitchen you know the average cook you probably wouldn't have the big grip you know grippy tools and such a innovative design hmm. well I, I'm uh, really looking at empathy how we can foster a culture of empathy mm -hmm. how we can transform uh, all the different aspects of our culture to raise empathy is uh, with throughout the whole society and in terms of that, I also, almost see it as a, as a design challenge in itself. How might mm -hmm. we inspire people to cultivate their empathy? Mm. And so to do an extreme user would be like going to a psychopath, really <laughs> really wanting to find a psychopath right. and what their experience is with empathy, as well as there are some people that have like some kind of an inhibition where they kind of empathize, they can't help it, but they mm -hmm. are trusting and so forth. So you'd really want to really hear what their experiences are and mm -hmm. hearing those extreme users would, would actually contribute. Hmm. To, uh, I would That's imagine. fascinating to think of a psychopath that would be the extreme user, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah I actually did an interview, there's a person that's uh, a person, uh, Sam Vaknin, he's written books about uh, psychopathy and narcissism, and he's mm. been diagnosed as a narcissistic psychopath, so okay. we've actually been doing empathy circles together, empathic wow. listening. So um, uh, it's it's been kind of really eye opening for him too, and I was like, "Hey, this really works. We're really having a you know, it's wow. really having effect." So and, I will um, look. I'm going to watch that on your site. Okay, I'll send you the link. Yeah. Uh, to that. So then, uh, in that article, the last part was uh, design thinking is not always the right answer. Was the mm -hmm. heading you had? Um, you want to go? Yeah, and that's something I also touched on already. If there's a institution that has um, funding from a particular donor or, or individual or organizational donor, and there there are so many constraints around a project that you you can't do this process. You have to make X, Y, and Z, and you know it. And and there are times when this is not this is not always going to be the answer. Or maybe you do need to design something that meets averages and average needs. It, it, this is not always the right process. Mm -hmm. I'm, and I'm talking about the design thinking process. I'm not talking about the empathy piece. I'm just talking about that this is a process that doesn't work for every museum all the time. Because I know that working in an institution there are a lot of constraints. But I always try to look for opportunities to bring in pieces of this process. Even if you know you are constrained to do a, you have to, whatever your institution has to make a print brochure, and that's that's it. Okay, well, even within those confines, how can you build some empathy for who's going to be using the brochure? How can you prototype it? How can you test it? So, so I, I recognize that this is a process that can be adopted wholeheartedly or in little pieces. Mm, okay.
And uh, so that was that article, and you'd also had, I saw you had done a talk uh, from Empathy to Innovation Design Thinking for Nonprofits at uh, the Nonprofit Technology Conference, and you had done a, a workshop on design thinking for museums from Empathy to Innovation Museum, that was at the Computer Museum Computer Network Conference. You, you want to mention a little bit about the talks you've given on this? Yeah, these are these have actually been workshops. Oh, workshops. And they're similar to the one that you mentioned that you, you did at the Stanford D School. You mentioned the gift giving experience where where the participants actually redesigned the gift giving experience for the partner. I've taken that that framework and adapted it to different design challenges based on the conference or the the situation. So, for example, I did a version of that workshop for the a museum studies class at JFK University, the visitor experience class, and we redesigned the museum studies student orientation experience, but we followed the design thinking process. So students actually interviewed each other, they built empathy for their fellow students, they prototype solutions, so we, we followed the process, but we used different design challenges. So I've done one, we redesigned the Sunday evening experience, I've done one redesign the LA tourist experience. Depending on who I'm working with, we, we change the challenge, but we use the same process and always come to amazing, amazing solutions that blow away the participants as well as the instructors. I did one for a software company and it was supposed to be redesigning 20% time, redesigning how their engineers work on 20% time. And we ended up coming with, up with solutions that were solutions for how can people across the organization collaborate and things that were not even about 20% time but they came, they came to ideas of we have engineers over here and we have marketing people over there and they want to do really good work and how can you connect them and have different ways of match, matching them and we came, one of the prototypes was somebody wanted to do an open mic night where they talked about project failures. Like, let's just be open in our company that a lot of these projects fail. And they prototyped a, an open mic failure night. And then they, in <laughs> prototyping it, they realized calling it failure was, was didn't sound that good. So they, they changed it to like an open mic success night. And then they prototyped that. And, and these start out, you start out thinking it's one thing and end up with something else. So a lot of the work I've done is, is mostly around workshops. Oh, okay. I find that talking yeah. about design thinking is one thing, but it's something that's better if you do it. And oh, some okay. institutions just want to just talk about it. Those are the places that want to sit in their cube and not get up out of their desk and do it. Yeah, so um, where do you see this going? Uh, you know, you're, it's... Uh, in terms of the empathy part, um, do you have any kind of insights going forward about the role of empathy uh, in, in this work? I, I just hope to get more museum professionals to become aware of this process and, and understand the, the value of, of human-centered design and to have more museum professionals actually experience what is it like to interview visitors for empathy and to go through this process. So I think that my my own personal agenda is to see this this thinking and this mindset kind of spread beyond just, you know, it's very, um, I, I think that the like UX designers and all the software developers and then, you know, the high tech companies are starting to really understand the value of this process but I think it, it's slower to take hold in, in a lot of um, institutions, especially I think visual, visual arts museums, even more so than, than science museums or children's museums, because those museums are more about learning and engagement, whereas a lot of the art museums are about scholarship and connoisseurship, and, and there's just a different culture that's, that's not a culture of, of talking to visitors. It's more a culture of talking at visitors because mm, there's this notion mm. that we are the experts, we hold the knowledge and you're here to learn from us and I want to have this become more of a, a dialogue and not so much of this one-way um, dialogue. Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So yeah, you're really, if you're wanting to spread the whole uh, the process uh, throughout the museum community, I mean, and that you're wanting to foster dialogue, instead of it being uh, just talking at people, that you really want to facilitate that kind of like an empathic dialogue uh, between the museum and its users and 
And I think Gretchen even wants empathic dialogue within the museum, too. Right, right. Uh, yeah. Well, in terms of uh, this is in, I'm, I'm looking at how do we I want to use human centered design to create more empathy in the world. Mm -hmm. So in the sen in that sense, what are your needs for empathy? If you looked at your personal needs, I mean, you kind of laid mm -hmm. out the human all, this overall process. Wh mm -hmm. What are, for you? What are you needing in terms of uh, a need for empathy in your personal or life or your mm -hmm. work life? Mm -hmm. Probably for my clients to understand that that I can't always solve all their problems and a lot of times I work with institutions that come to me and say help just help us solve our problem and I say I can't help you solve your problem I can give you these tools and we can work together but if you're expecting me to just solve your problem you're gonna be really unhappy and I'm gonna be really you know grumpy and 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 I'm gonna be unhappy too so I think that um, I would like to see more empathy from the clients I work with, how much you can really expect from somebody, and then I try to have empathy for them that they're probably being pushed in every direction and you know there's deadlines and budgets and just solve this problem now. So, mm -hmm. so I'm hearing a little bit of desperation maybe sometimes. Mm -hmm. It's like there's a problem and they're looking yes. to you to solve it yeah. with this sense of desperation right. and that you're wanting them to understand what you have to offer. And right. to, and actually for them to empathize with your situation so you're mm -hmm. you're needing a little empathy from them right and I just think the process works a lot better that way and 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 there are there are probably some some consultants who will say yeah I can solve a problem no problem I'll just come in and oh, do it but mm -hmm. that's not the process I I like to use anyway and I think the outcome is better if, if it's if it's a, a collaborative process uh, so you're, yeah. you're you're wanting to create some kind of a collaborative process with the uh, people that you're working with instead yeah. of just kind of BSing them or yeah. like I can do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, nice. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, that's great. I, I I'm so thrilled to you know talk to you. Because I, I'm I'm it, you know just uh, feeling so excited about human centered design as well because I'm really looking like as I mentioned several times of how do we foster empathy. And it's like, well, if we foster empathy, in a sense, we're fostering human-centered design, the first right. step. So right. they, it goes hand in hand. So I feel like, yeah, the more we do to foster empathy, the more we foster that whole uh, creative process. So I'm, I'm like thrilled right. about this whole this whole uh, process and using it and learning it mm -hmm. more and actually seeing how to apply it to itself mm -hmm. in the sense of applying human-centered design to fostering empathy. Right. Right. You know, so I'd love to talk to you more in the mm -hmm. future about that. I'm mm -hmm. interviewing, you know, more designers about it, and actually want to do more in terms of prototyping. You know, trying mm -hmm. things out, and I. Uh, so I would like to keep mm -hmm. in contact if that is okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think what you're saying about fostering empathy um, and, and like em empathy is helping spread human-centered design. It's kind of like the the um, the notion that if you want to believe something, sometimes before you believe it, if you adopt the physical posture, you almost trick your body into believing it. So it's like if you adopt the position of, of openness and empathy towards your visitors or users, then you almost like push yourself there, like what, what step comes first. So, so I, I think of it, I, I'm kind of making a parallel. I don't know if you've watched the TED Talk by Amy Cuddy. Have you watched her TED no, Talk about no. body language? And it talks about body language and presentations. It's a great TED Talk. Amy, T Amy Cuddy is her name. Okay. And she talks about, you know, if you, you want to go in and give a talk and you may feel nervous or insecure, you adopt the body language of someone who's confident and you actually like trick your body and next thing you know you, you become it. So in a way I think of of empathy as adopting this posture and openness and stance that this is a way to move people towards this direction. Uh -huh. So to foster that... empathy you take on the, the role or the, right. the body posture of empa right. empathy, empathic, like what is the body posture right. of being empathic and mm -hmm. then you take that uh, body posture and that will right. actually foster the quality. Right, right. And the attitude and, and the steps to get there I think can help foster it. Oh, and what is that body posture? 
Well, I think for museum folks, that means literally like getting out of your desk and getting mm -hmm. out into the mm -hmm. spaces where you're there. Hey, I'm here to listen to you. All I'm right. here to talk to you, museum visitor. Uh huh. Yeah. Just go out there and start the dialogue, yeah. and, right. and and that's that's the beginning of it. Exactly. It'll, it, it'll start a whole whole ball rolling. Exactly. A whole empathic uh, dialogue. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for summarizing it. Yeah. That's exactly what <laughs> yeah. I mean. Well, okay. Well, great. Um, then thank you very much for this dialogue. Is there anything else, Avisha? Have you been fully heard? Is there anything else mm -hmm. that uh, you feel you need to say before? No, we... I just want to know when this will be up on your site so I can send it to all my friends and colleagues. Oh, great. A couple days. I'll okay, have it up on, on Gretchen's page there, yeah. or actually, separate page for you, too. Mm -hmm. So I'll send you an email great. with that. Okay. Uh, Great. Oh.